Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is June 24th, 2015, and here's a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight, revolt. Millions of New York gun owners refuse to register their firearms. Plus, the left is now linking the Second Amendment to the Confederacy, and the Pentagon rewrites the law of war, declaring belligerent journalists as legitimate targets. Uh-oh. <laughs> All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Now, back in 2013, we saw the New York SAFE Act. Now, this was supposed to reduce gun violence in the state, but it just came out with some very interesting and pretty nonsensical measures, such as they wanted to change the buttstock on certain types of rifles. So instead of having a traditional buttstock or a pistol grip, you had to get the New York Safe Act approved grip that allows you to still fire the gun, which was completely ridiculous and did not save any lives. And now more to this, we see revolt. Millions of New York, New York gun owners refuse to register their firearms. And so far, only about 24,000 gun owners, most of them cops, registered their semi-automatic rifles with the state, meaning that the law has been effectively repealed through civil disobedience. And it also was aiming for things uh, like detachable magazines, how many bullets you could have in your magazines, so on and so forth. And also, I did a story last year, or maybe it was earlier this year, talking about how they wanted to limit the type of toy guns that you could buy. They wanted you to have a big orange sip, which I definitely would recommend, for your toy guns, but also I don't think it should be mandatory. I think we should better train these officers not to drive up to a child, jump out of the car, and shoot them. Now, of course, that didn't happen in New York, but we have seen these type of incidents happen throughout the country. So hopefully we can get some good sense going on in New York. But with Governor Cuomo, or excuse me, Cuomo, he said, you know, if you come to the state of New York, you need to believe what I believe. Now, he tried to say that is what the state believed, but he said if you're pro-gun, if you're anti this, if you're such, such and such that, you don't belong in the state of New York. We don't want you here. No, he doesn't want you there in his state because he wants to be with Bloomberg and these other control freaks who want to tell you what type of gun you can have, whether you can have aspirins and large sodas. Meanwhile, they have large bodyguards and throw these lavish parties where they do whatever the hell they want to do. And as we're speaking about the Second Amendment, let's talk about how the left is attacking the Second Amendment. You know, the blood wasn't even dry in Emanuel AME when people came out and they said, hey, let's go ban the guns. I had a chance to speak to a professor from Clemson, and he said it's not the gun's fault, it's the individual's fault, and people keep forgetting that. But now we have a professor, this is Charles J. Reed Jr. He's a professor of law at the University of St. Thomas, and he believes that states do not have the constitutional rights to pass laws nullifying the federal gun control legislation. And he was writing this for the Huffington Post, and he says that the Confederate ide ideology of the Second Amendment is the idea of nullification. This is what binds them together. And he says it is the belief that the states are the ultimate arbiters of what is or is not constitutional and that the states are thus always free to ignore federal law. Well, when you have federal laws trying to limit your gun rights or take your gun rights away, such as in my home state of Oklahoma, our governor Mary, Mary Fallon came out and passed a law saying that, hey, in the state of emergency or some type of big incident, the federal government can't come in, go door to door, and confiscate your guns like they did during Hurricane Katrina. So people pass these laws, states pass these laws, and it's not just for firearms, whether it's for gun rights or gay marriage or marijuana or whatever else. States can come in and debate federal bans on things as it pertains to what they do in their own states. And I think that's a good thing to have that check and balance so the federal government or the state government, for that matter, can't just run buck wild over the citizenry and just pass whatever they want to pass. And since we're talking about things being passed, how about the passing of legislation on journalists? Now, we've heard this administration say it's going to be the most transparent, it's going to be the most friendly towards journalists, but now we have this. Pentagon rewrites law of war, declaring belligerent journalists as legitimate targets. And the Pentagon has released a book of instructions on the law of war, detailing acceptable ways of killing the enemy. The manual also states that journalists can be labeled unprivileged belligerents, an obscure term that replaced enemy combatants. And this was from the Department of Defense Law of War Manual. And it talks about things like shooting, exploding, bombing, stabbing, or cutting the enemy are acceptable ways of getting the job done, but the use of poisons and asphyxiating gases is not allowed. And to go from the targeting of journalists, uh, I guess straight up murder of, murder of journalists, 
you guys probably saw that WikiLeaks v video that came out a few years ago, where they had the helicopter footage, I believe it was in Iraq, and these journals were out there, they had cameras, which to me looked like cameras, but they thought they were rocket launchers or whatever else. They opened fire on these guys, and then a guy pulls up in a minivan, he has his kids in his car, he says, oh my goodness, these guys were just shot, I wanna help save these people. So he jumps out and he's trying to help the journalist who had just been shot, and then they start shooting at the van that had kids in it. And the guy's like, well, you shouldn't bring your kids to a war zone. Well, you know, it's not like you live in Austin, Texas, you get tied to Austin, you can just drive down to San Antonio and live a very happy life. You know, you live in a war zone. And that's not even demonizing the military in general, that's just these particular incidents that happen, targeting of journalists. And then also talking about the gases that they're talking about here in this article, the poisons or the asphyxiating gases. I want people to understand this. As we're talking about this list, and I'll read it again, when you refer to shooting, exploding, bombing, stabbing, or cutting the enemy, but when it comes to poisons and gases, those are not allowed. And it reminds me of what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, because to put this in perspective, if we had a legitimate Red Dawn, if Russia or China or some other enemy foreign came here domestically and was parachuting from the sky, you could not shoot CS slash tear gas at that enemy. That would be a crime of war, but you can use tear gas against peaceful demonstrators right here in the United States of America. And people say, well, not everybody out there is peaceful. Yes, I definitely do know this. I don't have an issue with you know SWAT teams or police departments going out to stop riots. I understand that's what you need a SWAT team for. My issue is when you have a crowd of 90% peaceful people by and large over the course of several days or weeks, so I guess it's been months in the case of Ferguson, Missouri, and you choose to use these agents against the peaceful crowd mostly, that's where the problem is. Yeah, stop the guys who are burning down the hair salons and the liquor stores and robbing the, the Boost Mobile stores, I get that. I'm talking about when they use these instruments of war against peaceful American citizens, that's where the problem comes around. And since we're talking about things uh, if affects you, the American citizen, let's talk about the EPA and how they're being sued for endangering uh, pollinators with a new chemical cocktail. And it says, concerned citizens from the environment and food safety groups gave formal notice of intent to sue the EPA for approving toxic new pesticides under the name BCP. The agency's own risk assessment found that BCP alone exceeds levels of concern for mammals and hundreds of plants protected under the Endangered Species Act. So I believe it was last week, Alex was asking me some questions about this, talked about it on the show, talking about how life on this planet is endangered. Human life, plant life, all types of species are endangered. And now we have this new chemical that comes out and just flat out endangers even more people. We've seen things like Agent Orange. We see things like depleted uranium. And for people who don't know, that's something that's used in munitions. So let's say you have a big cannon or something you're shooting over in a foreign country. Well, even after the you know, crater is gone and you know, things turn back to normal, supposedly, you still have the lingering effect of depleted uranium. This is what many people speculate caused the Gulf War Syndrome. Many of our troops came home sick. So it's not just something that affects people in other parts of the world, it affects us here as well. But to tie it back to the EPA, we don't need another poison on the market. We already have enough stuff, courtesy of Monsanto. And we'll end with this before we go on to more special reports in our later segments. Let's talk about the surveillance state. Because we all know they can monitor you on your televisions and on your gaming consoles and on your cell phones and on your computers. And you see the special reports, they say, hey, put tape over your computers and your laptops so nobody can hack in and spy on you. And yes, that is a very real thing that can happen. But now we have this article from Fusion. You're being secretly tracked with facial recognition, even in church. And it brings up how the CEO of a facial recognition software company, Face6, says there are more than 30 churches around the world using his ChurchX technology. He launched the service just four months ago. It says churches are already using it to scan congregants' earthly visages to keep track of attendance at events in order to know who wasn't there so they can check up on them or who attends most frequently so they can ask those people for donations. He declined to name any of the churches using the technology. So this is what we see more and more whether you go to the football games, the baseball games, and now even in churches they have this facial recognition software even at large concert venues sometimes. And they say it's to keep you safe. They're looking for people with warrants and all this other stuff. But as it says, proof positive right here, also tracking you and see if they can hit you up for more and more money. And these are how things operate. You know, people like Catherine Albrecht have been warning about these things for years.
talking about how when you go to the grocery stores, you can have your face scanned without even knowing it. Uh, these uh, ticket counters, tracking your eye movements, trying to see what you're doing. So this just feeds larger and larger into the surveillance state and to anybody says, well, it doesn't cost me money. Well, it costs you money right there. And, and it's nothing wrong with giving money to the church if you have a good church, but I don't want somebody tracking me and saying, well, you come here a, a whole lot. I just want to hit you up for more money. That's definitely not something that I want when I go to a house of worship. So that's it for right now. Stay tuned because after this break, we'll have more special reports. We'll talk about the supposed rape culture. Now, do people get raped? Absolutely. But are we going to go as far as to call it a culture? We'll have some special guests to break that down for us. And also we'll have more special reports. Stay tuned. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Uh, the Republican leadership did not change their votes. They are pressuring Obama to pressure the Democrats. And it's truly nauseating. It's illegal on its face. It hands over our sovereignty. Three sections have been leaked by WikiLeaks. It gives Obama total open borders, total amnesty, allows corporations to shut down any businesses they want or sue them. It is dictatorship by a bunch of mega corporations. They've already gone to the UN and tr tried to get and partially got diplomatic immunity for international brokerage firms. I mean, it's just new titles of nobility. That's all it is, above the law garbage. And that was Alex Jones with a brief overview, brief synopsis of the TPP. And now we have this news. Senate puts Obama on fast track to TPP. With a 60-38 vote, the Senate adopted the law giving President Obama the power to fast track talks of free trade pacts such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership TPP after months of fierce debate in both houses of the Congress. The Trade Promotion Authority, TPA, as the measure is called, means that Congress will only get to vote up or down on treaties in question once they have been finalized by the White House without the ability to offer amendments. And that alone is bad enough when you think about this agreement, regardless of how you feel about the TPP. The issue is with this article that we can see that you can only vote on it after you get the, you know, I guess, press notes from Obama. It says, hey, this is what it's going to be. And now you have to decide, is it going to be all or nothing? Like maybe it has some things that you want, but you can't add amendments. You can't change it at all. So you have to take it all or nothing. And that alone is bad enough. And now we have different articles talking about Marco Rubio. And it says, Rubio cast deciding vote for Obama trade without even reading it. And it says, Senator Marco Rubio from Florida cast the deciding vote on Obama trade Tuesday as it squeaked through the U.S. Senate. TPA will, now that it's going to pass, effectively ensure that congressional approval of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So this is what we see. They're saying Rubio did pass the final ballot, and maybe he did, but that's not really the big issue here. Because if you think about all the people that have to be involved for something like this to get over, it's just like a basketball game or a football game. Yeah, you may have a kicker come in and with the field goal win the game, but all the points leading up to that mattered. You may have a guy on the free throw line that shoots the winning basket, but all the baskets leading up to that mattered. So it's not just Rubio. Everybody who was involved in the passage of this should be held accountable. In talking about Rubio, it's saying that he passed it without even reading it. This becomes more and more normal, I guess, in today's world when we're thinking about what is Nancy Pelosi or Rubio. We have to pass it to see what's in it. And now we can put that list back on the screen for our viewers so you guys can see how people were voting. And, of course, we have Rubio with a yay. Also, Dianne Feinstein, you guys probably heard about her. She has a yay. But some of the nays surprised me. When you look at Barbara Boxer, another Californian gun grabber, she voted nay. She had the good sense to say no. Harry Reid saying that you're a domestic terrorist if you like to own guns and have private property. He voted nay. Also, Chucky Schumer, who compared private gun ownership to Trafficking and child pornography, he said nay. So when I look at this, you know, it's not just a Democrat issue or a Republican di issue or a conservative or liberal, whatever. Some people have a good sense to say, hey, I may disagree with you on this, 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 and that. But at least when it comes to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I'm going to go and vote for America and say, hey, I want to have enough say in this when it comes down to it. So I just don't have to give a blank check, blank check to the White House and allow them to do whatever they want to do without any type of amendments to be offered. And if this TPP thing has you scratching your head, you can go to the Alex Jones channel on YouTube and check out the TPP playlist. You can learn about the TTIP, TISA as well. Many different reports from many different reporters on many different angles of it, trying to educate you 
about the seriousness of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now stay tuned because coming up after this break, we'll have more special reports talking about rape in this country. Yes, we do know that rape is a very serious issue, but does that mean we have a rape culture? Stay tuned. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. We all know that unfortunately rapes do occur, but does that mean we're living in a rape culture? Well, the journalist Lauren Southern, she goes out and she talks to the feminists. She talks to the rape victims. She goes to the slut walks and she asks these questions and she wants to know, you know, is it really the best thing to bring attention to rape by, you know, I guess so much exposing yourself, walking out in scantily clad clothing? And they explain to her, well, they say, well, you know, the whole point of this walk is to say that, you know, I can dress the way I want to dress and I should not be a rape victim. She says, you're exactly right. What they say after that may surprise you. If you want to know what my sign means, my sign means that this is not a rape culture because rapists go to prison here. There's a group of women that were here and they're wishing to withdraw consent to use the footage that you had, I guess, gotten. So Yes, and they gave us consent to interview. Well, now they're withdrawing it, so that's not how it works, but which is interesting given the event that you're at, right? At like a rally for like like rapists, uh, like, you know, consent and like withdrawing consent saying like no means no. So they're saying no and you're saying that like okay so if someone gives consent the night before and then they have no 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 listen if they have sex with a man and they give consent to him then the next day decide oh I regret it I'm gonna report him for being a rapist even though I gave him consent you're saying that's okay so you're you're sounding a little bit like a 12 year old because this is irrelevant Lauren Southern uh, reporting from Vancouver British Columbia and I know you get into it with them but I mean what about cultures like in areas of Africa or areas of the Middle East where women are literally prisoners and they're being executed for no reason. I never hear Gloria Steinem talk about that. The West is where women developed uh, their rights. The West has been the best, to quote Jim Morrison. I mean, I just don't get this hatred of the West, this f and, and this foaming at the mouth. Uh, and, and then feminists, I know at major universities now teach all sex is rape. I know there's also a big... Uh, kind of a pickup deal that butch lesbians use. I'm not attacking them, but it's, you know, basically, you know, saying that men want to rape them. I, I, I really think it's this whole anti-human uh, thing. I mean, targeting men. Uh, tell us what you witnessed there and your view on all this and what spurred you to go out and shoot this report. Well, speaking of whether it is a hatred of the West or whether they think it's an actual issue, I honestly think that a lot of the whole slut walk is about making individuals and women here look like victims. And they want women here in the West look like victims. They want it to be an attention thing. You can tell by how they dress at the slut walk, calling it the slut walk. Um, they don't want to focus on the real issues there. They want to focus on issues that affect them and will make gain them attention is how I see it. Um, because if you're talking about rape cultures in other countries where women are legitimately stoned for the crime of being raped, suddenly it, uh, it makes it seem like, oh, hey, it actually isn't that bad here in Canada. Women actually don't have it that bad here. But the feminist narrative is they want it to look like all women are still extremely oppressed so that they can get all of these um, entitlements and privileges just for the sake of being a victim. So that's, sure, that's uh, the new thing. It's a new form of royalty. If you're a protected group and a victim, then you basically are now the new nobility. Exactly. And you will, no one can question you. You look at what I did. I, the only reason I could question this group is because I was a woman. I do think that if a man had gone and spoke his mind, used his freedom of speech, uh, held up a sign, he may have been arrested. Uh, he probably would have lost his job. He probably... Uh, would have gotten 10 times the flack that I did. But because I'm a woman and I went and questioned it, that's why feminists hate me so much is because they have a hard time uh, complaining about me expressing my opinion as a woman. The only thing they can really say to me is internalized misogyny, which is just insane. Uh, the, the fact that I would hate women is just ridiculous. I am one. <laughs> um, but that's a big reason why I wanted to go to the slut walk. One, because I think that it is exaggerating and fear-mongering, and it has an agenda to do that to keep the feminist narrative going. And the other one is I think that it really 
doesn't represent women who were victims of brutal rapes that didn't do anything that could that, put, that took every precaution possible. This kind of says uh, all women who are raped kind of I, I don't know it represent it doesn't represent a certain group of women who have been assaulted or raped that took all the precautions necessary and that's not victim blaming to say that women should take precautions in some cases. I don't think it's anyone's fault if they do get a little drunk or dress inappropriately and get raped. It's absolutely the rapist's fault. But I don't think the slut walk should be speaking out against taking precautions. Sure. I think they should be encouraging it. Now, are we trying to downplay the impact of rape? Absolutely not. Are we blaming the victims? Absolutely not. And here's proof positive of that. A survivor of rape who actually had to be reunited with a child to prove her case. Well, there's a saying that if you are not outraged, then you're not paying attention. And now what I'm about to talk with you about today, you might find a little bit upsetting, but that's kind of the point. Hopefully enough people will finally be outraged by rape in the military that we can actually affect some change. So today I'm gonna to be discussing the institutionalized protocol of cover up of sexual assault in the military, as well as the mistreatment of those people who actually come forward and, and speak out about this. And Linda Nord shares her story with us today to let others know that they are not alone. I was down on the bottom floor of the barracks next to an exit door. Um, one night in late December, someone broke in and then my room was the, was the room next to the door and they broke into my room and I was raped. I reported the rape that night. However, the CQ office told me to wait and wait, and I waited for several hours in the office and nothing happened. And they told me to go back to my formation, which was morning PT. Um, about a month and a half later, I went to my first sergeant and CO and reported th that I had become pregnant from the rape. And they told me in no uncertain terms that I had better not be pregnant because I could get an Article 15 and be put in Leavenworth for destruction of government property. And so you I were that scared. government property, I guess? Yes, I was the government property. They um, told me not to say a word. So I went back to doing what I did. I ran PT, I did everything until eight and a half months pregnant and I couldn't do it anymore. When I went back there two weeks before I delivered, they took me off post to an attorney's office and told me I was to sign over my paternal rights or they would put me in Leavenworth. And if I went to Leavenworth, I was gonna lose that child anyway. So at 19, scared to death, I had no choices. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone what was going on. I, I had no recourse. Now, today, they're trying to pass legislation to offer a third party to report because the chain of command seems to be the issue. And in my issue, it was a chain of command. It was my first sergeant and my CO who told me that they would put me in Leavenworth. And that's it for our show tonight. Be sure to go to prisonplanet.tv and get yourself a free trial. You can see the Alex Jones Show, the nightly news, the special reports, the rants, all of it right there on prisonplanet.tv.